Do you like the headphones? Aren't they giant? Okay, the real reason I'm wearing them is because I need to keep my hair off my forehead and they're the only things that work because I'm not wearing an Alice band because that really doesn't do anything for my badass image. Anyway, okay, so, right. What I'm going to be talking about today is geography. Now, I know that that's kind of like WTF, um, except that when I say geography, I really mean political geography. Um, I mean, I guess it could be summed up by me saying geography is political, which is really not a groundbreaking uh, statement to make. And I apologize in advance for the fact that I'm totally going to ramble more so than I did in the last video. Anyway, so what do I mean by this? I think what made me start to think about making this video was that I just got really tired of people saying, oh, you're from Pakistan? Where in the Middle East is that? And the Middle East is not where Pakistan is. Pakistan is next to China, India, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan with Iran nearby. As a matter of fact, Iran isn't in the Middle East either. But it got me thinking, the countries that are classified in the Middle East include Egypt. Egypt, though, is in Africa. It's on the continent of Africa. And so then I started thinking about when I was in England, all the debates one would hear about Turkey, whether Turkey was European or not, um, and on what basis. And a lot of the times, politics, history, and geography, like literal looking at a map geography, used to get mixed up. And the very name, the Middle East, conjures up a Far East and a Near East, as it were. You know what I mean? Like, you have the Middle East, and then you have the Far East and a Near East, except what from what point of reference is this particular East in the middle, and that particular East is far, and this one is near. Um, so I guess what my point is, is that, for example, if I'm sitting in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia is really not to my east. Um, if I am sitting in Turkey, uh, I don't know if uh, um, Jordan or Kuwait are to my east. Um, if I'm in Thailand, then what is the far east or the near east to me? Um, and really, I, the point of all this rambling is for people to start becoming more aware of what our centers and points of reference are, not just because, I mean, not because I want us to tear down every single map ever made, but for, to understand that geographies are not free of politics in the sense that maps have also been drawn in terms of politics and politicking. It's what the British did, for example, in South Asia. It is what the colonial powers, including the British, the French, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Germans, the Belgians did in the continent of Africa, the results of which we can still see. Um, and it's what happened to the Ottoman Empire as well. So the boundaries of countries which perhaps we take for granted and label Far East, Near East, Middle East, um, Southeast Asia, um, what in fact is Asia or Europe, where Europe starts and Asia begins, Russia and Turkey both being cases in point. Um, uh, and for, you know, and for example, what Canada and USA are, because if you think about North America to the Native Americans and Native Canadians, the indigenous peoples, there were no such countries. Their particular territories of each different community extended across and beyond the borders that we now know that divide Canada and the United States. Anyway, so the point is that we need to be aware of what our centers of reference are, from where is the Middle East actually to the East. And, you know, it's not that I am against, um, like I said, maps or indeed of descriptions, but there is a difference between describing geography uh, and a and a, and a different and um, you know making an explanation about the history of a place, um, and what I mean by that is something that I've been reading in the essay under Western eyes 
Feminist Scholarship and Colonial Discourses by Chandra Mohanty, in which he says that the meanings we attach the, to our to the way we view the the world is something that we need to take care of in terms of how we characterize different communities and different people and of course these communities and people are based in different places and claims to land are of course nothing new um and it is people who make claims to land on the basis of any number of things on the basis of religion, on the basis of history, on the basis of um, superiority of race. Um, but people don't just make claims to land. They make claims about people already living on those lands or people that did live on those lands or the people who... And so the reason I'm talking about geography in this very muddled kind of way is so that we start re-examining um, what we take as our centers and points of reference, uh, not just when we talk about countries and places but also when we talk about histories because there are no countries in the world isolated from each other and all of our histories intertwine and it's dangerous to claim any sort of purity in terms of space or time or race or ethnicity or language and I mean I guess the last thing that I want to say is that it I know that the idea of home in terms of physical location is something that a lot of people experience with a lot of emotion um, due to any number of factors. And um, uh, a lot of people have ideas about what their homelands are, you know, homeland, like literal homelands. But it is also important to remember that in one sense or another, all of us are part of diasporas. Um, which can be traced back to 10 years or 100 years, either way. There's been too much movement and too much uh, interaction between all kinds of peoples for anyone to lay a pure claim to any kind of place and to any kind of belonging to that place. Um, okay, apparently that was the second last point I was going to make. The last point I'm going to make is um, that... In terms of places, in terms of geographies, and in terms of uh, politics, we also need to t take into account the history and genealogy of ideas. And what I mean by that is that every single idea from secularism to humanism to Marxism to different forms of socialism to communism to Sufism to different forms of Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, uh, Buddhism, Wiccan, uh, practices and beliefs, all of these did not ja ja have just one pure place of origin and they were not ideas born in vacuums, not of, not in terms of vacuums in terms of political situations, but also not in terms of vacuums of that vacuums that lacked contact from every other from all kinds of different communities coming from all kinds of different places. So that um, you know, I think I'm touching upon, you know, remembering that ideas have histories and locations as well, um, and indeed maps as well in terms of where they came from and how they've um, uh, transformed and how they've been adapted is because as a feminist, I often come up against this um, uh, polarization, uh, for example, between Islam and feminism, or, you know, that feminism is for white privileged women living in, like, the societies of North America, Europe, and the UK. Um, and I find these polarizations and, and binary divisions really disturbing and false and artificial and very destructive to the actual um, ability for any, all kinds of peoples to come together in coalitions and communities that are organized around causes that we all struggle for, toward. Um, and in this, again, I'm drawing from Under Western Eyes by Chandra Mohanty, in which she borrows Benedict Anderson's um, uh, idea of imagined communities. And she talks about how we can build coalitions about around causes and struggles that we all that we identify with and that we feel empathy and compassion for other people for. 
Okay, this is 10 minutes. I'm going to stop talking now. See you next time, Moose. Bye.